you know, I always knew my dad, like, he loved me, and, and he was always, like, affectionate, you know, he was, he was always a good dad to me, but, like, it was about a year and a half ago, I was out at his house, you know, before my mom got home, it was just me and my dad, we had cooked, and I was showing him some stuff that, you know, I had done on, on the internet, and he just stopped me, and he says, hey, and he looked at me, and he just kind of had that different look in his eyes, and he got choked up, and he said, you know, I'm proud of you, and, and I, I love you, and it was such uh, a huge moment for me with my dad, because he never, he never got choked up about things, he wasn't the crier, he was always like, had the sound mind, and you know, he's, he's, he's the rock for the family, but it was just kind of that, that, wow, dad, dad really cares, and he really, really must believe in me, and it was, it was huge. I love you, Dad. You know there's a lot that goes by the front door. Don't forget the keys under the mat. A childhood still shine. Always stay humble and kind. Go to church because your mom says to visit Grandpa every chance at you. piece of advice I received from my dad before he passed was to pay attention. Your life is happening now. And if you're not alert, you might miss it. What does daddy always say to you? He calls me Princess Fartula. <laughs> my dad says a lot of really awesome things. But one thing I'll always remember that he said is when me and my sister fight, he always tells us, remember that we don't keep score. My dad said this to each of his four daughters when they got engaged. I'll give you a thousand dollars to a boat. What's one thing that Daddy always says to us? He loves us.
Let that summer sun shine Always stay humble and kind Don't take for granted The love this life gets you When you get where you're going Don't forget to turn back around And help the next one in line Always stay humble and kind One thing that my dad always said to me when I messed up or did something wrong, he would say, use the brain that God gave you. And every time I do something wrong, that's what I think about every time. Thanks, Dad. My dad always tells me that life isn't always fair. As he eats the last round. He'd always say, it'll feel better when it stops hurting. One thing my dad always used to say growing up was, don't go with the culture, but be countercultural. And what that meant to me as a young boy growing up in Perrysburg, Ohio, was that it's okay to be different. It's okay to love people when they don't deserve to be loved. It's okay to play music and express yourself as an artist in a way that might be different from what the culture tells you because that's where our identity is found. One thing my dad always used to say is that no matter what, there was nothing that I could do that would make him love me less. And this meant everything to me because without even trying, from a young age, my dad was teaching me what unconditional love meant. So sweet and so... Tender. Well, welcome here. Uh, my name is Ryan Morrill. I'm our Kids and Family Director, and happy Father's Day, Day to all of you dads that are out there. As I look and watch that, I'm reminded of just what my father has done in my life, and there's no like one sentence that I would just mark to my dad per se, but I just know that in moments of indecision in my life, or moments where I need advice, or need to, to, to get off the fence in regards to um, something big that's happening in my life, and I need to go one way or the other, my dad would always point me in the right direction. So dad, if you're watching right now, happy Father's Day to you. And uh, again, dads, we're so thrilled that you're here today. And uh, you are making an incredible impact on the children that you have, whether your children are grown or they are little, maybe even sitting in your lap right now. Thank you for pointing them towards God, bringing them here today and setting an incredible foundation for your families and for their future. So uh, we got three big things that are happening um, that I'm going to be filling you in on here uh, at Kensington right now. What are those? involves dads as well as moms and whole families. Um, four weeks from now, a bunch of us are going to be up at Spring Hill Camp for our annual Rock Your Family Camp. I'm going to be up there. Our, uh, Michael Bouchard, Kimberly Pinkle back in our kids area are going to be there. Josh Korn's going to be there as well. And it's an incredible weekend where as entire families, you get to run, play, hop, skip, zip, swim, gallop all around Spring Hill Camp. And most importantly, worship and engage with God together as an entire family, which we rarely get to do in these days. Um, and it's a, day to, a time, too, where you get to just um, get to know others, too, and just build community. I grew up uh, at a small church in Denver, Colorado, and I got a chance to go up into the Rocky Mountains with my parents, with my entire church, several summers as a child. And I look back at those times. I just remember the feeling that I had there, just loving and savoring every moment as a kid, as I got to be there with my parents, I got to be there with my friends, and growing with Jesus and falling in love with him and even my church as well, just loving that time together with everyone. And we hope you can have that same memory as a family as well. The way you sign up is go to kensingtonchurch.org slash RYF, and we hope you're there that weekend to, to get to know you more and enjoy the time together. Um, coming up this week, Thursday is a big day for all of Kensington. We are doing a groundbreaking ceremony for our third Kensington campus, which is so exciting. Uh, Clinton Township is going to be um, turning up the dirt, starting, or even, I think they've even actually started to do that, but it's a big ceremony taking place Thursday night. So if you've been a part of this journey with us in the Everyone campaign, been giving to make that happen, or even if you're just joining us and you want to see what God's doing, we encourage you to go to that. Um, you have to RSVP, kensingtonchurch.org slash RSVP. Um, and it's again Thursday evening, and we hope you can be there for the celebration. And the final thing is we had our annual report, our annual vote just, just last weekend. And if you were here, we just want to give you an update to that. It was just an overwhelming 
yes and thumbs up as we had nearly 99, over 99% of everyone say yes, we agree with this. So thank you for being on the journey with us and just know that as we move forward with, with this new budget for the rest of 2017 and 18, it's going to really fuel and funnel uh, what we see God doing here and throughout the entire world. So thanks for being on journey with us. Um, so we're going to get going with the rest of our service now. Before we do that, by the way, the, we're on our week two of hashtag, uh, Bite Size Wisdoms. Today's um, service is called Hashtag Stuff My Dad Says. And so it's perfect for where we're at with Father's Day today. Before we do that, though, we're going to stand, stand up, greet a few people around you, and wish someone a happy Father's Day. As we know, it's the only home to life in the universe. Why? What is it that makes human beings so special? The answers are hidden deep within humanity. To find them, we must travel to some of the most dangerous places on Earth. Places where only the strong survive and the weak are in danger of becoming extinct. But we dare to travel to these treacherous corners of the Earth to gain an understanding of human behavior. A lonely growl echoes throughout the human's lair. It is feeding time. The grown adult male's offspring are also showing signs of hunger. The male enters the area of the lair where the food is kept. But this time, food is scarce. The offspring are consuming an astonishing amount of food, sometimes twice their own body weight. It is desperate times. Desperate times call for desperate measures. It is time for the hunt. The male is making his way on his companionless odyssey. He knows the importance of today's hunt and that his entire family is relying on his success. These are tense times. Other ravenous hunters arrive as well, hoping to find success on their own exploration. The male human enters the hunting ground. It appears that everything is in place for a successful hunt. He eyes the area where he has had success before. The aisle contains pre-packaged food, easier targets. But how to reach them? The other adults encircle the prey. It's an impenetrable wall of metal and man. The adult male moves to another part of the hunting ground. He waits perfect opportunity. One of them is alone. But it's too big for the male to tackle. He sees one that looks smaller, but is perfect for his family. This morsel will feed the whole pride for at least one evening. This could be a disaster. If this other human takes his prey, his family could be in serious jeopardy. Success, but only for a moment. One certainty of the hunting grounds is that there are no certainties at all. This could be devastating. The male human knows that his family is on the brink of starvation. Every minute that passes by could be critical to their survival. Finally. The 
male human swells with pride at his latest kill. Tonight, his family will retire with full bellies. The dramas that play out here are a savage reminder of how important food is for all life in these communities. Happy Father's Day. There you go. That's what we men, alpha males, have to do to defend and take care of our families. And I, and I got to say, listen to you laughter at that thing. I got to thank Mike Nelson's over there and Mike Molnix, who isn't here. They, they created that whole video. Came with, That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? Planet, Planet Humans. Uh, next week, we're going to do the same thing. Um, you don't want to miss these. We've got one of those for, e for each week of this series, Bite Size Wisdom. But, you know, this is our day, guys. This is Father's Day. It's an amazing day. I mean, that's what we do to take care of our families. And uh, I'm actually a grandfather now with a couple and hopefully many, many more. If any of my sons are in the, in the auditorium right now, I need more grandkids. I need more grandkids, so get on it. So um, uh, anyway, uh, really great to have you here on Father's Day. I love this day. I love being a dad. And, uh, I, you know, I, I jotted down in my notes. I was like, what am I some of my best dad memories. Well, first one would come to mind is when they were born. I have three sons, they're all married now, but when they were born, and the first one, CJ, he's 31, so 31 years ago, I almost missed it. You know, Ann starts going to labor, so we go to the hospital, but she's sort of settled down, <clears throat> so they put her in a room. <clears throat> Doctor's not even there yet, it's, nothing's really happening. So I'm like, honey, do you think it's okay? You know, it's our first one, do I have time to go to the bathroom? She's like, yeah, you got time. So I go to the bathroom. Now, I need to say this, um, when I go to the bathroom for a certain number, you know, it's more than a minute or two. I might be like the 20-minute guy. Anybody? Come on, show of hands. It's church. Be honest. If you're too embarrassed to admit it, just call him out or call her out. Yep, 20 minutes. Um, so I might have been gone a little while. I think I read a couple of Sports Illustrated articles. Anyway, when I came back, she's in full labor. Doctors are there, nurses, the lights and stuff are going on. I'm like, I barely made it in time for our first son, but I'm glad I was there. But all three births were, were incredible. I actually wrote down, you know, one of the other memories that comes to my mind is uh, playing catch in the backyard with uh, my three sons. At, you know, at each age as they got to the area where they could catch a ball and throw it back. I think, as many of you know my story, I never once had that memory with my dad. You know, I was about six and a half, seven years old when the divorce happened and he left and we never did that. So. I can remember being in tears the first time, like I'm playing catch with my son. Dad, you know what I'm talking about? With your daughter, your son, it's just like, it's a moment. Uh, another great memory for me is watching all three of my sons give their life to Christ. Uh, I was there, and then we went on mission trips, and they were just special moments. I can remember, uh, so precious to me, uh, being in our Troy Campus Chapel as the dad, but also the minister at all three of my son's weddings, and standing there, literally looking at my future daughter-in-law from that day forward, and telling her in the ceremony, Ann and I have prayed for you for decades. We didn't know your name. We just prayed that God would bring a woman of God to our son, and he brought Robin and then Kendall. Actually, Austin, my middle son got married first, so Kendall and then Robin and then Jenna to our family as an answer to prayer. You talk about a precious moment. And then I added, oh, well, obviously, you know, the fifth one I wrote down was having two grandkids. I have a, a granddaughter, Olive, and Porter, who are out in Denver, and I wish they were closer, and again, I need more. So that's awesome. And then the last one I wrote down, which is really special, I'll never forget this moment, sitting with my sons when the Lions won the Super Bowl. That was just an <laughs> Oh, wait, that, that hasn't happened yet. That hasn't this year? This year? Yeah, okay. Uh, you don't believe me. You don't believe me. So here's what I want to do. Because it's Father's Day, and I know how this day can be. It, it can be a wonderful day for dads. It can be a wonderful day for sons and daughters. But it's also a hard day for some of us. Some of you, like me, didn't really have a very good relationship with your dad. I really never did. And so Father's Day wasn't that special. I didn't have a close relationship, so it was hard. Some of you might have lost your dad or your husband even this year or sometime in the past. My father has passed many years ago, and so sometimes that's difficult. And so there's all these mixed emotions going on. But here's what I want this Father's Day, Day to be. I want to speak to the men, the dads in this room. 
I really do. And so first of all, I'd like to honor the dads and the grandfathers and maybe even the great-grandfathers. So if you're a dad, grandfather, great-grandfather, please stand up. We want to honor you, celebrate you. I want to pray for you. Just stand up. Yes. Give these guys a hand. These are the, the dads in our community. And uh, I would say this. Do not sit down because I think solidarity with me, if I got to stand through the whole message, you do too. <laughs> What do you think? And I think you should shave your head, too. You know, be one with me. No, I'm not kidding. But I don't want you to sit down for a second, because I want to say something to you before I get into the message, which I wrote for, you, for the dads. It's going to apply to everybody, but it's really for the men and for the dads. But let me say this to the men standing right now. If I could look you in the eye, sitting across a, a, a lunch table or dinner table, here's what I'd say. I'd say, thank you. Thank you for what you do. I honor you and I respect you as a dad, as a man. I mean that. And I know as a dad, what you and I often hear is not honor and respect. We hear critique and you're not good enough or you're less than or you're too over the... We hear that more than anything. So I know what you and I carry. That's a hard thing to carry. I just want to be one man in your life to say, don't listen to that. Listen to this. You're a good man. You are a good man. You are a great man. In fact, I would say this, from the heart of God to you, God looks at you and says, I am proud, I respect you, I am honored by you, and I will never, ever give up on you. And if you're sitting or standing here right now and you're hearing a different voice in your head like, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't measure up, I, I, I blew it yesterday or I blew it this year, here's what you need to do. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Put that away. That was yesterday. That was this morning. You start new right now to understand you are a man that has been given incredible power, that'd be the second thought I'd have for you is, do you realize the power that you and I have as dads? It's something hard to explain, but God puts it in that title, dad. I mean, even when anybody looks at me and, and says, what do you think about your dad? Just that word dad brings emotion to your sons and daughters, and it is a power that's hard to explain. So now as a father, God has given you a role to say, I have put in your hands power. Use it wisely. And that would be my last thought is I want to challenge you today. This message is for you. Others can listen in and it will apply to them. But this is really for you to step up and me to step up to be the man of God and the father and the grandfather God's called us to be. And here's what I mean by that. Yesterday's done. Start right now to be the greatest man of God and father you can be. It can start right here, right now, as you make a commitment today to say, I'm no longer going to live here. I'm going to live in a new place. And you may think it's too late, and it's never too late. Start today. God's going to do something great in you and through you to leave a legacy that will be incredible because that's what God does through dads. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for these men standing. They represent the men and the fathers and the grandfathers of, of our community. They are leaders. They are influencers. They are, they are powerful, powerful men, probably more powerful than we can even understand. But God, you have put that in this role. So Lord Jesus, I thank you for these men and who they are and what they are and their, their identity in you that is powerful. And God, I pray today that we as men of Kensington and men of Orion would step up to the challenge to be the men God has called us to be. God, thank you for Father's Day, for this chance to stop and honor and challenge all at the same time. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you don't want to be a real man, you can sit down. But if you want to, you know, I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, sit down. Sit down. So here's where we are. We're week two of Bite Size Wisdom. And it, it's a perfect uh, time to talk to men. Oh, by the way, you're going to stand up the whole time? I love it. It's a long time, man. I'm going 88 minutes today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> hey, by the way, I was told uh, by Becky Lee, our campus director, that she watched a family come in today, and their, their dad went to Nebraska. They don't even like Nebraska, but to honor him, they're all wearing Nebraska stuff right now. Where are you? Are you in here somewhere? Over there? Stand up. We got to see this. This is awesome. Way to honor your dad with red and white. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. That's cool. So if you guys wanted to honor me, you could have wore lion stuff today. I'm just saying. I saw one over there, lions. By the way, did you guys know I was the chaplain for the Nebraska Cornhuskers in 1980, 82? Did I ever say that? 
Yeah, I'm a Cornhusker at heart now, man. Lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, and South 12th Street. Anyway, so here we are. Um, Bite-sized wisdom. We started last weekend, and if you know what it is, it's basically the book of Proverbs, which is a book in the Old Testament that every verse is a bite-sized wisdom. It's a nugget of wisdom from Solomon who asked God for one thing, and God gave him wisdom. He asked for wisdom, and so he wrote this whole book. There's 31 chapters. We Hopefully, you started with us a 31-day challenge last week where you take the proverb that matches the day. Today's the 18th, so hopefully you're read or you're going to read Proverbs 18. And there's a nugget of wisdom there. And so it's really interesting. I've never in 27 years taught on this proverb ever on Father's Day. But there's one in chapter 4 that maybe you've heard before, but I think it applies to dads as well as everybody. But to set it up, i got to go to uh, Proverbs 4, verse 20. Solomon writes this. He says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Now, what's going on here is a conversation between a father and a son. So... Fathers, what he just said is, your son should listen to you. So every dad, you can nudge your son or daughter right now and say, do you hear that? That's out of the Bible. You listen to what I say. And I, and I mean that, because it says, not just sons, but daughters. It says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. That means lean in. Do not let them out of your sight. Focus. Keep them within your heart. That means apply it. And for they are life to those who find them and are health to one's whole body. So it's, it's really an advice for, for sons and daughters to listen to your dad and your mom. But today's Father's Day, so listen to your dad. And I'll tell you what, one of my application uh, for, the, for the kids here today, you want to give your dad a great Father's Day gift? How about today or tomorrow or this week you say, hey, dad, I want to ask you some questions about your life and listen to his answers. Because if you lean in, and focus and listen, not pull out your phone and start tweeting or going on faith. If you listen in, I bet you there's some wisdom there. In fact, you probably know, we, we called it today, Stuff My Dad Says. That's how that opening video is, things that we heard from our dad. Now, I didn't even have a dad in my house most of my life. When I was seven, he's gone, and I probably saw my dad two or three days a year my whole life. He was an airline pilot based out of Miami, Florida, and I could fly free as a son, so they would fly me down to see him two or three days a year. So I didn't hear a lot of things my dad said. But I was thinking this week, one of the things I do remember him saying, here's what I wrote down. I remember my dad saying this, finish everything you start. He always said that, finish where you start. He says, you never quit. You never, ever quit. If you start something, you don't quit. And an amazing thing, my mom copied the same thing. And some of you single moms are like my mom. You are, this is happy Father's Day to you because you're the dad. That was my mom. She would not let me quit anything, weren't allowed. You sign up for a ball team, and you don't get to play, and you're on the bench the whole season, guess what? You're not quitting. You know, we live in a day and age, like, I'm out. I didn't get what I wanted. I'm out. Nope, wasn't allowed to do it. And it taught me character that you don't quit ever. That's something I learned from my, from my dad. It's interesting. He said this. I'll never forget. He said often, don't give a half blank effort at your job. Now, I don't need to say what the blank is. You can fill that in, but that's the way he sort of communicated. It's like, when you go to work, you go to work. You never show up and give anything but excellence. And that's driven me ever, ever since. You know, it's interesting. Every time I went to see my dad, and he didn't talk about God much, but every Sunday he took me to church. And I never even realized that in a very quiet way, he planted a seed of faith in me, stuff my dad said. It was interesting. Uh, one time he was up here in Detroit visiting me. I, it was after we had started Kensington. We were a young church, and uh, actually I was driving, and he was in the passenger seat. We were driving to a band rehearsal, and I got my love for music and started playing in bands as a young kid because my dad was a drummer in a band and put himself through college by playing gigs. And so it was pretty cool for me to be driving to a band rehearsal where he got to listen to his son play guitar when he's a musician at heart. And as we're driving there, I did something you're not allowed to do in my family. I asked him a question about the divorce. That was something you never talked about in my home, never. You just don't do that. It's not allowed. I only heard my mom's side my whole life, never talked to my dad about it. But I'm a man now, and I want to know. And so we're driving, and I said to Dad, I go, hey, Dad, I'll never forget this. I go, you ever regret the divorce? I went there. I didn't know what he was going to say. Before I finished the sentence, he answered very loudly. I said, hey, do you ever regret your divorce? He goes, hell yes. I was like, wow, really? I go, why? He goes, because I missed out on your life. Stuff my dad says. And in those two words, I learned all kinds of stuff. I learned this from my dad. He didn't even have to say it. He just said it in two words. He said basically this, don't quit because I quit and I missed something I've never regretted 
my whole life. He went to his grave with that regret. So I learned from a couple words from my dad. He was saying, man, think long and hard about giving up on something before you give up. Some of you walk in here today and you're really, really struggling in your marriage, and I get it, marriage is really hard, and some of you are thinking of giving up, and I would say from my dad and from me to you, don't give up too quick. Just fight. Fight. Hold on. If you need help, we're here to help any way we can. That's what we are, a community that will come around you and help you. Don't quit. You may go to your grave with a regret about a decision made too quickly. I also learned this in those two words from my dad. I learned he loved me. Just by saying that, I missed out on your life. I'm like, oh, he really loves me. And I never felt that most of my life. I'm like, wow, stuff your dad says has wisdom in there to live by. And Solomon starts this section of the, of the, song, or of the Proverbs saying, listen to your dad. Pay attention to his words. Man, what a gift you could give your dad today. Even if he doesn't live here, ask him some questions and then lead in and listen. And then you jump down a couple of verses to verse 23, and here it is. This is the whole message today is out of this verse. He says, above all else, guard your heart. Above everything, top priority, number one thing you should do, the most important thing you can do in your life, guard your heart. Now, it's like, what does that mean? Guard your heart is like, protect your heart. Build a fortress around your heart. Don't let anything in your heart that can destroy you. It says, Guard your heart. Now, to understand what he means by heart, you've got to understand the Hebrew thinking. The heart was the center of your life. It was, it was he's obviously not talking about your physical organ that's beating right now. He's talking about the, the seat of your emotions, the seat of your decisions. Everything in life is centered right here. It's like the center of who you are. It's the core of who you are. And he says, protect that because out of that is how you live. And it's like, you know, we talk about your mind and your heart. They just talked about your heart. It was like the center. But in our culture, we still use that word heart, Right? To describe a lot of things, right? Like we use the word heart. Like think about this. If I said somebody that never quits and they just keep going and they just keep going and they keep pushing, pushing, we say they have a lot of, yeah, right? We use that word to describe, you know, certain things. And there's phrases and adjectives we put around hearts that we all understand it sort of describe. And I'm going to do a little quiz with you, okay? I'm going to describe a certain kind of heart and you tell me the, the phrase that we use to name that heart. And I think it'd be fun to, to add a little music to this. It'll, it'll help you know the answers to these, these questions. So my first question would be this. What's the greatest rock band in all history? Come on, you know it, right? Yeah, it's hard. You know why it's hard? Because their lead singer is Ann Wilson, huh? You got you to gotta love heart, right? Hey, easy on you. Right, I'm just kidding. Anyway, so, so that gets you going. So here's the first question. Uh, how did I write this one down? Um, oh, yeah. Someone who feels isolated and alone. They have what? You know it, right? Anyway, you know that little yes? Come on. You know that, right? All right, so owner of a lovely heart. That's, that's, that's a lonely heart. How about this one? Someone that's gone through a really hard breakup in a relationship, they have what? How can you make <laughs> How can I lose that ever? <laughs> Come on, you want to sing it? Please help me back this road. Yeah. <laughs> And let me live again. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, I think the Bee Gees talk like that. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Yeah. It, it's hilarious out there. But that was a great song. You knew all the, you know, you, it's just a broken heart is in there. Here, here's one. Uh, you don't even need, I won't even ask you a question. You'll know from the opening lick. Go, 
called, right? All right, we're done, we're done, we're done. I gotta keep going. You know what? You guys are pretty good singers. I gotta tell you, you're pretty good singers, you know? Um, and you guys know me, I could do this all day. We're Sergeant Pepper's Lone. Anyway, um, but no, I mean, we have terms that we, we use that word heart all the time. If, if you're gentle and compassionate, we say you have a soft heart. If you can't keep anything inside and everything you feel is out there, you, we say you have your heart on your sleeve. I mean, it's just the way you are. If you're a vindictive, bitter, revengeful woman, we say you're a hard-hearted woman or a hard-hearted man. I know I'm not going to pick on the women, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's because we know the heart is sort of the, the seat of our decisions and emotions. Now, here's what's interesting. Solomon says, above all else, the most important thing you can do, and he's speaking to men and women, but I'm going to apply it to dads today. He says, guard, protect your heart, and then you go, why? And he answers the question. You go on to the rest part of the, of the verse, and it says, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you and I do flows out of our heart. What's that mean? The heart is like a spring. It flows. Everything we do comes from here, our behavior. And we always talk about, you know, uh, change your behavior, guard your behavior. It's like, no, 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 no. Why would you do that? You start here because what you be, be, how you behave comes out of what you believe. So he says, guard your heart for everything comes out of it. I'll never forget. Seminary, 19... 82. Was at Nebraska till 82, then went to seminary for three years, got a master's in divinity because I knew God had called us to ministry full time. We want to get trained. So Ann and I are there in our third year of marriage, and we're in Southern California going to seminary. And I learned a ton of great stuff in seminary. What I'm doing right now, I learned how to do in seminary. But I'll tell you, probably one of the best lessons I ever learned came in a very unusual way. I was in class, a pastoral major, so there's like 15 or 18 of us in class. Don Weaver got up to teach that day. Don's the president of the seminary, was a pastor for 18 years, and he's teaching us things about future church ministry that I'm now doing. So here, I'll never forget. He comes up one day on a Monday. He goes, I got to tell you guys what, I, what happened yesterday on the freeway, you know, before class started. And we're like, yeah. He goes, uh, I was getting on the I-10, and this dude cut me off. And I pulled up right beside this guy, young guy, and I started screaming at him. He started screaming back at me. And we're just, you know, going up beside each other. And said, all of a sudden, next thing I know, I just flipped him the bird. And the guy took off. And we're like, what? <laughs> what are you telling us right now? The president of the seminary just told us he flipped the bird at a guy that he doesn't know because they got in a, a little road rage on the highway yesterday. What is the point of this story? You've got to be kidding me. And then I'll never forget what Don said. He goes, you know what I did next? And we're like, what? You know, we, you know, we're just like, this thing probably ended really badly. He goes, I just sort of looked down at my heart, and I said, heart, what is wrong right now? We're like, what? He's like, you don't change this. This is an overflow of this. And he goes, I knew the second I did that there was something wrong. He said, men and women, I have not been guarding my heart, and it will always be shown in actions. You know, if you want to change your language, you don't wash your mouth out with soap. It doesn't do anything. My mom did it to me when I was 14. <laughs> she did. I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. You ever say that at the dinner table? Yeah, well, I cursed, and she goes, I did it. She literally washed it out. Guess what? It didn't change my language. Because this is a reflection of this. See, that's what Don, that's one of the best lessons I ever learned in seminary. He's like, oh my gosh, you don't go after behavior, you go after the source of behavior. That's why Solomon says to all dads today, and all of us, obviously it applies to all of us, above everything else, there's nothing more important than this, protect, guard, build a fortress around your heart. In other words, man, be very careful what you let come in here because it's going to influence this, and it's eventually going to influence this. You know, all the time, we're going to talk about this next week, and people talk about, well, I don't know what to do with my, my sexual life and temptation in my life. It's like, well, I want, I want to correct my behavior. And it's like, no, 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 no. you got to talk about your heart. That's next week's proverb, by the way. You do not want to miss next week. Ann and I are going to be teaching on temptation in the sexual area. What do the proverbs, what's wisdom say about this area? So Solomon says, man, above all else, Guard your heart. Now, here's the thing. What's wrong with our heart? Why does our heart lead us to bad things? Well, here's the amazing thing. 
Let me ask you another quiz question. Do you think mankind innately has a good heart or a bad heart? It's a very important question for you to know the answer to. I remember my senior year in high school, in a literature class, we had to read Lord of the Rings. Wait, wait, no, excuse me. That's Lord of the Flies. Remember that one? Those are two totally different books. <laughs> Lord of the Flies, these boys on an island, remember? And I'll never forget this. Walking into class, we debated for a week every day, for an hour every day of a week. The class was split right down the middle. Man is inherently good. No, man is inherently bad. And I'm sitting in the middle going, ah, ah, ah. Wilson, what do you think? Ah, I don't know. I did not know the answer to that question. Been in church my whole life, never knew the answer to that question. Guess what? I know the answer now. Do you? And it isn't my brain came up with the answer. I couldn't come up with the answer. I could look at, do an anthropological study of mankind and make some deductions, but I went to the word of God and said, if he's the God of the universe and he made us, what does he say is true about the human heart? Here, I'll tell you what he says. You go back to uh, Jeremiah 17. He says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? What? God is saying, your heart is deceitful beyond all things. He, he's saying, you ever done this? You ever laid in bed at night and go, why did I say that? That was evil. That was hurtful. Why did I step into that gossip? Because your heart has a scariness to it that hard to even understand. You know, people say all the time, I've heard this many times, just follow your heart. No! Don't follow your heart. It'll lead you to dark places. Don't even tell your kids that. Oh, just follow your heart. I understand the sentiment behind that, but it's actually a very bad piece of wisdom. In fact, you go to the New Testament, it's really interesting what Jesus said about our hearts. He was having this discussion with disciples and some others, and he said this. He said, he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? They're talking about eating food and what kind of food can we eat. He says, that's not the question. He goes on to say this. What comes out of our person is what defiles him. For from within, look at this, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Wow! That's what comes out of our heart. And he says, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. That's what Jesus is saying. Same thing Solomon said. You better guard your heart. You better protect that heart. Now, hopefully you're sitting there, and I, I, I hope you're leaning in going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we have a problem here. If that's the heart I'm born with, and it's a sinful, deceitful, scary heart, what do I do? Now, I know a lot of you are like, I already know the answer to this. I'm at church. I know what he's going to say. But I'm hoping there's somebody here who's like, I don't know the answer. Guess what? There is an answer. And it isn't guard your behavior, start acting religious, go to church and give some money and stop cursing. And that's not the answer. And by the way, that's what many people hear at church. And that's not the answer. That's the result of the answer. That's the overflow of guard your heart. Here's what God says. You can't change your behavior with that heart. You need a heart transplant. You can't do it, and it's internal. And again, we're not talking about physical heart. We're talking about something only spiritual, only God can do. He says, so you have to surrender your life and your old heart to me and say, can you fix this? And he says, no, I'm going to take it out and give you a new one. And again, not physical, spiritual. I'm going to put something in there that's not you. It's me. In fact, you think I'm going to go to the New Testament to prove that? I'll go back to the Old Testament and quote Ezekiel, who is quoting literally the words of God. And Ezekiel said this. God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Do you understand what Ezekiel's telling us way back a thousand years ago? He goes, God will put his heart in you and take your hard, stone heart, human heart that's deceitful, beyond wicked, remove it and put his capital S, Holy Spirit of God in you, and when that Holy Spirit comes to your life, guess what the result is? You keep his commandments, you obey his laws. Why? Because out of the overflow of a new heart, the heart of God, you have a new life. Now, let me tell you something. Is that good news or what? Oh my gosh, pretend you've never heard this before, and you're like, 
You mean there's a heart for me that, that you can give me? Yeah, anyone that asks for it. It's like, it's like God comes and he gives you a new heart, and then he goes, Holy Spirit defibrillator. He goes, life. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit goes, bzz, 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 and you're like, boom, and you pop off that table, and you're like, I'm going to live a new life. How does that happen? God does that. You talk about the greatest news you've ever heard in your life. You just heard it. It's like, oh, my gosh, that's available? You'd be lining up right here. Where do I get that? At the foot of the cross. That's where you get it. And the one who died on that cross rose from the dead, and that's the power that's in that new heart that's in you. You talk about happy Father's Day. I'm like, dads, that's available to you. Oh, my gosh, it's awesome. It's like, okay, so that new heart goes in there. And then Solomon says, now guard that because that's the pure heart of God. Do not let defilement creep in there and darken that. He says, guard that. So here's all I want to do for my last couple minutes. I want to give the guys the way to guard your heart. And here's what I do. I know men. I don't know women. I can't understand women. Who can? They're so beautifully complex and they're different every day every hour you know but guys were just simple here's what the dudes are thinking right now most of the men in this room right now are thinking dude just tell me what to do i don't need any just tell me what to do and i'll walk out here and do it am i right guys it's like let's go and that's what we do at man up we're just very simple so here guys i'm gonna give you five stays women you can write these down you can listen in this is for everybody but i want to talk to dads you want to guard your heart, all you got to remember is the five stays. Every year at the end of the football season with the Lions, I say, you guys are going to be gone for a couple months. Here's, here's how you keep your walk strong. Five stays. Most of the guys can say it because I do it every year at Last Chapel. Here it is. First one is this. Men, you listen and stay in what? The Word. Stay in the Word of God. It's that simple. Stay in the Word of God. I, I, I don't need to go all through the Bible to convince you of this. I can just go to the book of Proverbs and read you a proverb. Proverbs 30 says, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So here's what I also know about men. And it's probably true of women too, but I know this about men. We make great boasts. I'm going to be a man of the word, and then we don't follow through. And I also know this about many church men. They say they're men of the word, and they don't know the word. It's really sad, and it's true for women too, but it's like, you're, you've been going to church 10 years? Tell me what Romans 3 says. Ah, uh, where's that? Is that New Testament? It's like, okay. I just saw the overflow of what's really going on. Guys, I challenge you, stay in the Word. I mean, we started last week. Cody was here, my son, preached on this. I watched it. Uh, I was out, out, I watched it. And as he started, and he said, do the 30, 31 day Proverbs challenge. Tell me you're doing it. I hope you're all doing it. If you didn't do it last week, start today. Today is the 18th. Read Proverbs 18 today, guys. Just read it. And take one, one thought. Just say, God, lift something off this page that I need to learn. There'll be something in there and apply that today and tomorrow I'll do the same thing. Trust me. I ask guys all the time, what did you read today in the Word? And I look at me like, well, I didn't read it today. Okay, what did you read yesterday in the Word? Uh, what did you read last week? Uh, what did you leave that? Guys, I challenge you. Stay. Stay means keep consistently staying in the Word. Second one, stay close to a brother. And this applies to women too. Stay close to a sister. You can't do the Christian life. You can't be a dad alone. You need other men. I meet with my guys tomorrow night. We'll spend four or five hours together sharpening one another. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as one man sharpens, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. That's what we do. Proverbs 13 says, the wise walk with the wise, a fool walks with fools. You become who you hang out with. You try to be a man of God and you're not with men of God, get good luck. It's never going to happen. Whoever you're hanging out with is going to rub off on you. So pick your friends wisely. So I say, stay close to a brother of God and let him sharpen you and sh you sharpen him. You want to guard your heart? Stay in the word, stay close. Third one, stay away from what? Stay away from what? What do you think? Yeah, I'd say temptation. Maybe it was already up there and you saw it. You knew the blank. But I was going to say stay away from sin, but it's like, God, forget sin. Stay away from temptation because temptation, if you play with it, it's always going to lead to sin. It's just like, stay away. Know your weaknesses. Share those weaknesses with another brother and stay away from temptation together. Look at this. Yesterday in Proverbs 16, actually two days ago, I read this on Friday. It said, the highway of the upright avoids evil. Those who guard their ways preserve their lives. You want to preserve your life, guard your way. Look at this. Proverbs 5 says, keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. And you're like, who is she? Next week. 
Seriously, you come back next week, you will know who she is, and you will better be staying away from her. So here's the fourth one. Stay in the word. Stay close to a brother. Stay away from temptation. And here's the way to do it. Stay on your knees. Stay on your knees. What's that mean? Surrender to Jesus. That means when you're on your knees, think of this. When you see a man like this bow down, you know what most people in our culture think of that man? They think weak. They think, look at the guy. He can't even stand up. He's just, he's down. He's surrendered. And if you understand how manhood works, you realize you're looking at the strongest move a man will ever make. See, when a man says, I can't do this, God, I need you. And I need your power. I need your heart in me. I need your spirit in me to be the husband, to be the dad, to be the man in this church, in this community, at, at the workplace that I need to be. God says, I will give you power when you surrender. Before I walk up on the stage, every week I go in that back little thing and I get on my knees and I beg God to do something in you that I could never do. Am I in a weak moment then? No, in the strongest moment of my life, admitting that I need God. So stay on your knees. Because out of that posture comes strength for the final stay. Stay in the words, stay close to brothers, stay away from temptation, stay on your knees, and finally stay alert to the battle. See, we get so naive to not realize we are in a spiritual war for your family, for your faith, for this community, for this church. And guess who God wants to lead us out of that war? Men! And women, I talked about on Mother's Day, are women warriors? Yeah, it's right there in the, the very uh, defining moment of when God created women. But today's for men. I'm saying, man, God has called you and me as dads and as fathers as men to stay alert, to be at the front door of our house. Metaphorically, it's like we're standing at the front door of our house and we protect the, ho- the house. We protect the home. We protect the church. It's like we stand there, we got our eyes on the kids, like, there he is. Here comes evil. Here comes evil. Proverbs says, shun evil. So it's evil telling me, you're not getting in this house, not this house. You go somewhere else, you're not coming to this house because I'm defending my wife and my kids. You're not getting in here. And I'm standing at the front gate of my church. You're not getting in here. I'm standing at the front gate of my neighborhood. Evil's not coming here. Why? Because I'm a man of God who is alert to what's going on now. I'm not asleep. I'm not afraid. I'm standing here with the power of God. It's like I am defending my family because I'm alert. Do you understand what that means? That's Happy Father's Day. That's what we're called to, men. And that changes the world when we stand up alert, not waking up like, oh, I just want to be happy today. And if somebody, you know, messes with my life, no, it's we wake up in the morning. It's like, we're going to war. Where's my ammo? Where's my, where's my brothers? Let's go. Where's it coming from today? We shun evil for our family and for our community. Guys, are you in? It's like, man, this is what we're called to. It's, it's such a high calling that so often we wake up just almost like in anesthesia. It's like, oh, I just want to be happy. God has never called us to be happy. That even promise it. He said, I'll give you joy, but you're in a war, and so let's go to battle. So here's how we're going to end today. I'm going to show you a video. And some of you have been around here a while. have heard the story of Steve Andrews with his dad, Chubby Andrews, a doctor in Memphis, who has since passed. But this is a story when Steve was seven years old. And, I, and, 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 and if you've never heard this, it's a great day for you, because you're going to hear a story about Steve's dad in a moment that shaped Steve's life. Steve's our founding pastor. He's speaking right now at Troy campus. And that story shapes us. Even as you watch this, you'll be able to get a sense of the personality of Kensington from this one story. Because it has shaped an entire church decades later. And I got to say something. As you watch this, we're going to ask you to give as well. We're going to take our offering. Let me tell you what the offering is. The offering is a warrior moment. It's a step-up moment to trust God to provide for us when we give back to him something that he's given us. So thank you for doing that. Many of you are guests today. You don't have to give unless you want to. Your next step is go to starting point. Why do I say that? You're like, I want to do something here. Where do I start? Starting point. We'll meet you there, and we'll help you take the next step. But give to God and let God speak to you, men and women, through this story. Hey, I'm Seth Stark. I'm the video director here at Kensington. When I started on staff in 2005, it was just two months after Steve Andrews' father, Dr. Chubby Andrews, had passed away. So I never met Chubby, but I heard all these great stories from Steve and other people. Well, 10 years ago, we had the opportunity to go back to Steve's hometown in Memphis, Tennessee, and spend one day with Steve, driving around town, and he would get out and he would share different stories with us, things that he did with his dad. 
And so we did show one clip from that 10 years ago for Father's Day, but the rest of the footage went into our archives and we forgot about it. Well, a few months ago, we were looking through it and found all of that great footage again, and we thought we would take all of it and put it together into one long video that we're calling Going Home. And you can check it out at kensingtonchurch.org slash going home. And today, we're going to show one of those 13 clips, and it's called Defend. Check it out. The Mississippi River right here on Memphis, which of course is the Bluff City overlooking. You're looking over into Arkansas. But this is uh, the whole whole area of my life kind of built around this. Home of the blues right up here, boys. You got to get some B-roll of that. This is the Baptist Medical Center building right next to where the Baptist Hospital used to be right here. Dad was on the fourth floor there for almost 40 years as a doctor. My brother Rad worked with him there for many years. Rad's out at a different hospital since this was closed down now. But this is the site of where I learned what a Christian man does with his anger. He defends the honor of his God and the honor of the people around him and for the benefit of others. It all happened right here. I was about seven years old, 1963, and uh, dad always loved to take the, us with us whenever he could. And believe it or not, he was one of those doctors who would take us on rounds. On Saturday mornings, he would go see the patients that he had operated on during the week, and he would take us and let us go from hospital room to hospital room with him. I remember as a boy watching him pray with sick patients that he had, was taken care of or listen to them or care for them and saw the regard and the love that they felt for him. It was just an amazing thing. Well, this particular Saturday morning... We got, uh, there was actually a crosswalk here between the, the building on Dudley into the Baptist Hospital. We crossed the crosswalk and we're here in the hospital taking an elevator ride. Uh, and we had actually gone up and seen three or four patients. And we got on about the fourth floor of the elevator. And as we were getting on, another doctor who later I was discovered was uh, a, a man that lived on our street got on the elevator with us. And as soon as he saw me and saw my dad, he looked at my dad and he said, well, if it isn't Mr. G.D. Christian and his G.D. Jesus Christ. Just, uh, I didn't know this at the time. He was a very foul-mouthed man. He loved to ridicule dad for his Christian faith. And I'm a seven-year-old boy standing there. The man that walked on was about my size now, probably 6'4". 220 pounds. My dad was 5'11", but, but pretty stout. And I was not prepared for what next because I'd never seen my dad's anger before. Uh, we were in a huge elevator uh, that would, you know, probably the kind where 20 people could get on. And we were on one side. Dr. Yates was on the other. My dad exploded across the elevator, smashed him against the wall, grabbed him by the collar, and proceeded to share the love of Jesus with him. He said to him, listen to me, Frank Yates. He said, I ought to take my fist and smash it down your throat right now. He said, but I'm not going to do that because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. (laughs) And I'm seven years old, just absolutely stunned by this. And he says, and I want to tell you something, Frank Yates. He said, you can say anything you want about me. I think he'd called dad Mr. G.D. Holy Man, something like that in in this whole exchange. And uh, he says, you can say anything you want about me. He says, but you will not talk about Jesus Christ like that in my presence or in the presence of my son. Now, many years later, I look back on that, and I realize that dad wasn't defending the honor just of Jesus Christ, but he was defending my honor as well. Standing right here where this elevator was, he was not going to let this man intimidate me or teach me to be afraid of life. And so I learned that a real man defends the honor of Jesus Christ and the honor of his children. And you might remember, some of you may have heard a verse in the Bible that talks about Jesus. It's a prophecy of Jesus that said, zeal for his father's house would consume him. In other words, when he saw, when Jesus came into, into Jerusalem and saw the religious leaders blocking people from God because of all the religious rituals and the, the mercenary activity, the consumers and the selling of goods and of animals, 
Jesus went ballistic. He went crazy for his father's honor and for, the, and for his brothers and sisters that he came to save. He did all that because of love. And I realized that day, my dad was the first thing that I ever said, what does a Christian man do with his anger? It's okay to be angry if you're angry for a just cause and if you're defending the honor of your God and your family and for the benefit of others. Men particularly get so caught up in their work. They, get, they have this idea that work is everything and they get so committed to their legacy of what they're going to build or produce, you know. And here I am standing where the Baptist Hospital used to be. It's not even here anymore. This is where my dad did his work and he did his life. And you realize that the legacy of a person's life is in the people they invest in because it's not even here anymore. You know, when dad slammed Dr. Yates against the elevator, I wondered what was Dr. Yates thinking, how he would respond to that. Let me just tell you the end of that story. Almost 25 years later, Dr. Yates had been struck down with a stroke. He was home and bedridden, unable to even speak except for curse words. Think about that. And when he was finally able to say something other than a curse word, the first request he made was for Dr. Andrews. He asked for Chubby, my dad, to come visit him. And one of the first things dad did was to go after his stroke and pray with him. We're pretty sure that Dr. Yates had an encounter with Jesus Christ at the end of his life. And frankly, I don't think it would have ever happened had dad not stood up years before, right here. God's called us to not be passive men. And if you're not a passive man, it means you're going to make some mistakes. You might cross the line. You know, there were times when my dad probably went too far. But I think that it, that is an important decision to make, whether you're going to take a risk in life to stand up for what you believe is right, rather than just hang back and let the world around you fall apart. Let, let evil people win the day. That was something my dad was never going to let happen, and I hope that's going to be true of me and of you. website and watch all 13 lessons you just heard one and it's so powerful it, it shaped who we are and guys I would say to you and really all of us don't live passive stand up defend make a difference I mean Steve told me that Dr. Yates was a bully to everybody at that hospital and it sort of stopped that day when a man stood up to a man and said not here and I tell you what the best way to end a day like this on Father's Day is to stand up and sing about the warrior that God is. Now, here's what, here's what I think sometimes. I think I hear this. Men don't sing at church. Women sing at church. Men don't sing at church. Men don't sing? Have you ever been to a Bruce, Bruce Springsteen concert? Have you ever been to a U2 concert? You ever been to a Foo Fighters concert? I've been to all of them. And men are jumping around and singing. It's like men sing. So why wouldn't they sing at church? Think about this. You know, when, when you go into battle, often soldiers sing before the battle. I wish I should do this sometime. I should take my phone out and, and video for you the tunnel at Ford Field before we take the field for a game. It's so cool to stand there in that tunnel. They start singing. I don't even know what they're singing. It's just, you know, and they're chanting. And it's like, what's going on? They're going to battle. A battle that's not eternally significant. It's a game. But yet, yet they're firing themselves up by saying, this matters. Let's bond together as community and sing. Well, guess what? The battle we fight is eternally significant. And so every once in a while, soldiers need to stand up. And sometimes they raise their hands and say, I can't be a warrior unless he's a warrior. So we're going to sing a song, a couple songs together, that says, God is a mighty warrior. It's epic. It's anthemic. It's like every man needs to say this out loud to, to fire themselves. Like, that's who we, that's the commander in chief that we're going to battle with. So I'm going to invite you. Josh is going to teach you this course. You've never heard it. It's so simple. You'll learn it in a heartbeat, and then we'll sing the song together. And let's, as a community, as a community of men, sing to the warrior who makes us warriors to go to battle. Let's do battle here before we do it out there. Let's sing. I got a mighty warrior. 
I want you to sing it out with me. Here we go. Our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory you reign. We triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander, you conquered death forever. In victory you reign. We triumph in your name. But let's do sit up in this place. Oh, 
more. A little more of a classic for us. Let's put our hands together in this place. And when we get to the chorus, I want us to hold our fists up because our God is victorious. Here we go. Here we go. today how in Christ with a new heart new spirit of God to be the man to be the dad to be the person God's called me to be some of you need to walk forward and pray with somebody just to to release something and walk out of here the rest of you stay in stay close stay away stay on and stay alert and then come back here Wednesday night
Don't come back here Sunday. Come back here Wednesday, and then come back Sunday, because we have our midweek service where we get to sing God is our warrior and then hear great teaching about the reckless love of God and then go back to battle again, and we'll see you again next weekend. Have a great week. Happy Father's Day. See you Wednesday night. Bye-bye. Yes, I am.